Jumptron. You tell them, sister. The top 10 best boss battles of all time. Now take this one at surface value because there was so much good stuff I had to leave out, I was disgusted. Anyways, here are the rules of this list. Each of these is a boss battle which I feel was really memorable and had a lasting effect on me. And I'm only using one game per series or two or three games would dominate this list. Oh, and Jacques has a quick disclaimer. Spoiler alert. Look away if you see a game you haven't played. Number 10 Gruntilda the Witch from Banjo-Kazooie This boss wasn't as memorable for the battle itself, even though that was pretty cool in its own right. No. Gruntilda was notable for being a bitch throughout the entire game while you were climbing her castle. You see, this is something I feel the gaming industry has forgotten to do with newer games, make you honestly dread and despise the main villain. I don't know if it's just me, but in modern games, the bad guy seems to be nothing more than, look, it's the bad guy, bam bam, explosion. Yeah. In Banjo-Kazooie, it was a different beast altogether. You had to listen to this dried up wench try to be the beastie boys throughout your entire journey. <laughs> I guess she installed an intercom system in her castle. After all this time spent listening to her, you formed that special kind of gamer relationship with her. You knew her, and even kind of liked her, as well as despising her. It's a fine line, but you felt it nonetheless. By the time you got atop the castle, you were so sick and tired of her that you came out eggs blazing. Number 9 So you'd been training for hours and hours in Pokemon Blue and Red, aspiring to be a Pokemon Master, leaving a trail of fire in your wake, defeating gym after gym, earning badges, and gaining recognition all around Kanto. Your final trial? The Elite Four. This relates back to the whole Gruntilda argument. The Elite Four were mentioned since the beginning of your journey in the world of Pokemon, and you could always feel their presence looming in the distance. That way, when you finally got to them, it was like meeting a celebrity. I really like this boss, if you will, because it wasn't really a boss. It was real people, just like you, the best of the best, the top of their league. Only you were taking home the gold medal this time. There's not much to say about this quad core of Dot Matrix Poke Athletes, but I'm sure anyone who's played the original Pokemon games would agree that they were sincerely memorable in every way. Number 8 Get it? Boss? He's a great boss? <laughs> the great thing about Animal Crossing is, there are no bosses. I'm not even joking, and I don't care if I sound corny, I think I learned something from this game as a kid. All my life prior to playing this game, everything was about doing, and getting from point A to point B in the fastest time with the greatest efficiency. Punch it at I guess we can thank our corrupt school systems and our society's medieval age parenting techniques for that. In this game, you could go from point A to point B and back to point A again in however long you wanted, and that was okay. Some of my best video gaming experiences were had just walking across the breezy shore at night, finding a gyroid in the sand, and taking it back home to add to my collection. The simple joys in life just can't be outmatched. Animal Crossing had no boss, and that was just fine. Number 7 Conker's Bad Fur Day is one of my favorite games of all time. I can't think of one game similar to it. It's unique, and it's more or less impossible to rip off. That's because it's pure genius all the way through. It was a blend of style, perfect gameplay, comedic genius, and technical prowess. And not to mention, at the time, it was the best looking game I'd ever seen. Sure. Its scatological exterior may have turned some people away initially, but if you dig a little deeper, you'll find gold in them there hills. Or was it... corn? The Great Mighty Pooh is one of the greatest boss fights of all time because not only was it a boss fight, it was a five-star opera as well. I 
am the great mighty poo and I'm going to throw my shit at you. Are the simple you charm of this boss and this game in particular has yet to be recreated for me to this day. If you're playing Conker's Bad Fur Day, you better watch out or he'll take your head and ram it up his butt. Your butt. My butt. Your butt. That's right, my butt. My butt. My butt. My butt. Number six. This game was weird as shit, and probably has one of my favorite storylines out of any game ever. Look at this, just fucking look at this! In Majora's Mask, you played as the time-weathered hero Link in a parallel storyline to Ocarina of Time, and you had to stop the moon, played by Robert De Niro, from crashing into Termina and ending all mankind as we know it. This is one of the darkest, scariest, and most unsettling games I have ever played. And at the end of it all, you had to fight a trippy mask with tentacles. Need I say more? If you collected all the masks throughout the game, you got the fierce deity's mask, and you got to lay the smack down on Majora's mask. This battle was psychedelic, creepy, and just plain weird. And I loved every minute of it. Number five. So you're wandering around on horseback as Wanda, or Wanda, if we're being Romaji about it. Not quite sure yet why nothing happens in this game. Determinately galloping in the direction of your glowing sword, you are suddenly struck with awe, open-mouthedly gaping at the beast that lay before your very eyes. I remember the first time I played this on the PS2, I don't think I'd ever seen gameplay of this caliber before. The music, the feeling, the realistic weight and grip of your character, the sweeping landscapes, the style, the fucking magic. All of the colossi in this game are worthy of mention, but I feel the first one held the most weight and was the most memorable. After killing the monster, you are left to ponder your slaying of the seemingly innocent beast, and left to ruminate over who the real evildoer was. That, my friends, is the mark of a well-made game. Nay, artwork. Number four. Baby Bowser's final form from Yoshi's Island. This is a little dark for this game, don't you think? Just listen to that music. Yoshi's Island is home to some of the happiest tunes of all gaming, such as... But when the final hour beckons, Baby Bowser doesn't fuck around. After beating his initial form in the baby room, Kamek transforms our favorite mini Bowser into a titanic version of himself, and you are left to view him from the distance, watching in horror as he inches ever closer to you and your inevitable doom. But wait! Lucky for you, some balloons happen to be carrying giant eggs for you to launch at him. What luck. I could go on and on about how much I love Yoshi's Island in this boss, but I'd run the video way over limit if I did, so I'll just let the footage do the talking for me. Number three. I'm pretty resistant to scary movies and games. I've always been. But Icon of Sin? When you enter its arena, you're welcomed with this ungodly noise. I know it's just John Romero being a douche in reverse, but when I was four, I didn't know that shit. I can't think of another boss that commands such power. This game was so badass that they made the last boss a wall, and it's still one of the goddamn scariest things I've ever seen. Icon of Sin would warp in enemies through a hole in its fucking head. The only way to kill him was to make like Luke Skywalker and get the one perfect shot. If you wanted to beat the real boss, you'd have to go Jesus on his ass. This is for making Daikatana! Number two. I had to pick from all the Super Mario boss fights, and though I really love the one from Super Mario 64, this was clear as day for being my top choice. I may be guilty of donning the nostalgia shades here, but hot jumping Christ, this boss battle stirs emotions deep inside of me. Super Mario World was the first game I owned and played, and let me tell you, I played it to a pulp. Nothing will ever be the same as completing Star Road and finding Special World all on my own without the internet. Nothing. 
I'm aware that this is purely for personal reasons, but that's what this game is to me. It's part of my soul. That aside though, I think this is a pretty amazing boss battle in its own right. This was such a happy game. Fun and cartoony characters, colorful levels, and I don't know, sometimes the game could be a little eerie, but nothing scary. Then came this. Fucking A, that shit's dark! After platforming your way through all the levels in Super Mario World, you get to face off with Bowser atop his very own castle. This is the first time Bowser is seen in his clown helicopter... thing. And it's something I wish they would bring back outside of Mario Kart. It's awesome! He would drop cannonballs on you, set the stage afire, and even freak the fuck about for a while. You know, he'd be pretty much invincible to your attacks if he didn't drop ammunition for you to throw at him. What kind of way to kill Bowser is this, anyways? Eh, whatever. One notable thing is that Peach just looks... off in this game. I love this boss battle. I love it to death. I can only think of one greater. Man, they always talk about Jubileus in Bayonetta. But you beat the final boss and you never get to see it. Well guys, that was the countdown. I hope you liked it! HOLY SHIT! That's right, the game pulls a bait and switch on you. It even pretends to wrap up the story before the last boss comes back to life and takes Bayonetta up into space to resurrect the real boss, Jubileus. If you've played this game, then you know you play as Jean during this part, while you ride a motorcycle up a rocket carrying Bayonetta into space and then turn into a jaguar and run up a giant stone ribbon and take Bayonetta out of the eye of a gargantuan space goddess. <gasps> Jubileus is hands down the most spectacular boss fight of all time. It goes back to the Gruntilda theory. Yeah, we're calling it that from now on. Every time you kill a boss in Bayonetta, they make sure to let you know about Jubileus. This hypes up the boss in your gamer mind as the biggest, most baddest thing there could ever be. If these giant monsters were referring you to an even more powerful one, well holy shit, have you seen the monsters in this game? Jubileus is huge, she's a god, and one of her lesser attacks is shooting galaxies at you. What boss have you ever known to shoot galaxies at you for fuck's sake? She has many different forms, which you'll have to face one after another without dying, and that's pretty hard because the game limits the amount of health power-ups you can have at one time. I can't even count how many times I screamed at the TV during Bayonetta due to its ridiculous difficulty, let alone just at this boss battle. After beating her final form, you control her as she, and I shit you not, careens past all of the planets in the solar system and burns up inside the sun! Finally, we did it. We beat the game. Oh, what the fuck? What the hell? This isn't even the first time this game pretended to end twice. What game has ever done that? I remember being strung along the entire time when I first experienced that. I couldn't believe they pulled one over me twice. So after this, you have to go into the sun and literally demolish every last piece of Jubileus. In the sun, destroying- oh my god, what the fuck, how did- who made this? It's- it's not even over after this. There's some long cutscene and then- music video of Bayonetta dancing? Man, this is really fucking hot. This has been a JonTron Top 10. Here's his delicious.